Massive thank you as always to our top tier patron, Sarah Turner. It's Not Just In Your Head is hosted by psychotherapist Dr. Harriet Frad, substance use disorder counsellor Ekoi Hero, and myself, the editor and producer Liam Tate. This podcast is entirely funded by listeners, and as the famous meme states, we are critiquing capitalism because we are forced to participate in it in order to survive. So, if you can afford to give, then your contribution will ensure that we can keep making the show. However, if you can't, then please just leave a review on your podcast platform of choice, tell your friends about us, and follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Reddit, or YouTube. Massive thank you as always to L for organizing our monthly reading groups and episode discussions, which you, dear listener, can join in too. Just head over to our Eventbrite page and the link is in the show notes. In the mental health field, too often, we've made it seem as if it's just in your head. Just in your head. If the landlord can hijack the rent by 20%, that impacts people's mental health. We can have a profit for the mental health care system if we want our people to be connected and healthy. I'm an author and a journalist. I worked for The Guardian newspaper for many years. One of the things I did there was write a column about self-help culture and the science of happiness. It's called uh, This Column Will Change Your Life. I spent a lot of effort explaining to people that it was meant to be a tongue-in-cheek title and that I was not actually trying to launch myself as a self-help guru. I wrote a book called The Antidote about the problems with positive thinking and and most recently this book, 4,000 Weeks Time Management for mortals, which is about being finite and not attempting to live one's life entirely by the ethos of relentless efficiency and optimization and all the rest of it. I'm really interested in the sort of psychotherapeutic, the psychodynamic psychotherapy perspectives that have that I've been. I wasn't necessarily pursuing them in the book, but in terms of conversations with people since, I've I've become aware that I was plowing some adjacent furrows, as it were. I read The Antidote many years ago. I thought it was brilliant. And maybe I can weave some of the stuff from that into this as well. But I thought the the marketing of 4,000 Weeks was really interesting because <laughs> potentially it looks and it looks and sounds like it's something you'd find in the bookshop under personal development and self-help. But I thought actually it was the two fingers up to that category in some ways. I thought it was quite subversive. I don't know what the reception has been. You mentioned the sort of psychoanalytic maybe reactions to it. But I think the reason I th- thought it was subversive is just because you're slightly slapping productivity nerds around the face. <laughs> um, yeah, no, totally. It's been interesting to me looking at how the different publishers chose to market it. I really love both the UK and US jacket design for this book. But what's been so interesting has been that even with a, I think, fairly literary publisher, FSG in in the US, it does look significantly more like some kind of a bit like a business ebook for the in the American market. And in the British market, it looks a bit like a sort of a sit back and relax and chill out mindfulness book. And yeah, a whole bunch of people have used the word confronting in describing it, to which I was not expecting. I never really use that word much myself but they said I thought it was really confronting and I think they mean that they felt that it was calling them out but it's only doing that because I'm calling myself out it's just the advice I really needed to hear to be a less of an uptight productivity geek yeah I am very taken by your work and by your dealing with the concept of time and I read an article in the journal rethinking Marxism I looked on the net and I couldn't find it But it was very short, and what it said was that before capitalism started in the 17th century in Switzerland, people saw time as agricultural, the sun, according to their agricultural rhythms, the sun rises, the sun sets, and so on. But when capitalism arose, time is money. You get money for a certain amount of time that you work, and so time and money are intimately connected because before that, why bother measure how many hours, how many seconds it takes you? And I wondered what you thought of that idea. I found that article very compelling, but I haven't thought about it as much as you. Yeah, I think it's really fascinating. I was consciously evasive in my book about the sort of causal chains here because there is obviously an understanding of this that sort of puts capitalism as the causal engine of all sorts of <laughs> very bad things. I've always been interested in that idea that 
capitalism itself is a kind of a symptom of a way of dealing with the fear of death and the fear of finitude and limitation. We can talk about that if you like, but but clearly this process of that began with the invention of the first clocks and then continued through the industrial revolution and all the rest of it led to this this idea that time is a resource, that time is not just what we are or the medium our lives unfold in, but is like a thing that we have and can use well or use badly. You can fight against time. You can all these different metaphors that all are based on this notion that there's us and then there's time. And I think that there's good reason to believe that like medieval peasants, like around here where I am in Yorkshire, all those centuries ago, just wouldn't have experienced it like like that. That separation, I guess maybe it's a kind of alienation, although I'll concede, I'll defer to all Marxists present about the use of that term. But that, that it's a kind of a it's a kind of a separation that yeah is not inevitable at all and is the basis of all our sense of being tormented by time and all the capacities of the economic systems we live in to exploit people with respect to their time. First of all, it has to be this separate thing that, uh, or seen as this separate thing. It isn't really, of course, because you never have time. Uh, you never really possess more than the present moment. But uh, yeah, I think it's a really interesting sort of line of thinking. It reminded me, actually, the chapter on time, it reminded me of this meme where there's three pitches. There's Isaac Newton and there's a quote, time is absolute. And then Albert Einstein, time is relative. And then Karl Marx, time was invented by clock companies to sell more clocks. <laughs> and it's not quite that, but you are pointing at something. And there's a quote that was, I mean, there's a lot of stuff. I can see why people might have said it was confronting because once I'd made my notes and I'd collected various quotes, I, you can put them all in a list and they they have a kick to them. For as long as I could remember, my days had been spent striving for future outcomes where eventually time would run smoothly. We exist in a sense of joyless urgency. That last one is a quote from is a quote from Marilyn Robinson, but yes. It's, yes, uh, yeah, it's true. I did combine a whole bunch of stuff there. Maybe some things got lost. But I guess the sort of subversive point in this, particularly if a, a particular kind of audience has come to it not expecting it, is that the reason you can't get on top of things is because becoming more productive just seems, and this is a quote, just seems to make the conveyor belt move faster, right? Yeah, yeah. And and that's where you there is a sort of maybe a soft target on capitalism. I wanted to just add to Liam's statement that people decided to invent a clock upon which they declared that time is an eternal truth. <laughs> yeah, I think that idea that recurs in all sorts of areas of economics and elsewhere, it gets called the Jevons paradox in some contexts, but this notion that it, it has connections to Max Weber, I think, but anyway, that if all you do with some system, including the system of your own personal productivity, is to make it more efficient, then all else being equal, it'll just attract more inputs from Right? You become capable of processing more. It's like if you're, this is a, I'm quoting myself, I think, but if you, if you become the person in your office who can handle a certain kind of project far quicker and more effectively than anybody else, what do you think is going to happen? You're going to get, you're going to get given more and more of that, uh, of those projects to have to do. And I think the interesting part to me, or part of what's interesting to me about that is, sure, you can rail against the system and you can say it, it's pe people shouldn't be exploited in the way that they are or, or pressured to become more efficient but the thing that really interests me is that sort of deep inner sort of collaboration that we have with that right we or many of us anyway want to get to the state of being on top of everything want to become more efficient and optimized and think that at the end of the light at the end of that tunnel is this state of having everything running smoothly. I actually think it's quite a sort of religious Calvinist idea, which maybe makes the connection to capitalism obvious too, but like the, this notion that like we can somehow save ourselves by putting in enough work and being able to process a sufficient number of tasks. 
when you talked before, you said you tend to think it's more about death, but of course peasants died too in the feudal times, so I wanted to know what you meant. What's the connection to death and time? I'm just talking in huge, broad brush historical causation terms here, but I guess what I would say is that I think wanting to find ways to not have to think about or confront mortality is as old as human consciousness. Ernest Becker wrote it in great length about all the different ways in which you can understand the things humans do as ways to symbolically feel like they don't have to die. I think what happens from in ter- with what happens with clock time is that at a certain point, this becomes a new way that we have, as it were, to try to deny our mortality. I think probably, you know, you could say the same about systems of currency, right? So I feel like what we're constantly doing as humans is finding new ways to build systems that convince us, that to help convince us that we don't have to face our finitude. And capitalism is a really excellent one in that regard because of the sort of, the there is no limit on that symbolic level of the capital that might be accumulated or of the technologies that might be invented, the size that an organization might grow to. All of that is belongs to some infinite realm, which we as creatures <laughs> definitively do, do not. I guess that's what I'm thinking about there. I don't know if that makes sense to anyone. <laughs> yeah, I remember reading somewhere that like to paraphrase that modern life is just an endless to-do list and then you die. And you, and you make that point in numerous sort of interesting different ways throughout the book. There's one quote, your life isn't leading towards some moment of truth. It never arrives. Life is nothing but a succession of present moments culminating in death. <laughs> and that you'll probably never get to the point where you feel you have things in perfect working order. So it's interesting, right? If to some degree part of the current modern working environment or society in general is dangling the sort of bo- bogus carrot of possibility, if you get more productive, you'll have all these things that you think you want or need. If that's ultimately hollow and... Certainly, you definitely make the case for that sort of future-chasing mindset that there's a sort of emptiness that happens from living this kind of project-driven life. I think what's interesting is this idea you said that that to some degree we're cooperating in the dynamic, that there is a willful need to be distracted from mortality, and that manifests in all kinds of different ways, right? Obviously... Social media is one of them, but you have this sort of thing about, you know, I guess that's why I was referring it to maybe like a light slap in the face, because ultimately you're trying to steer people back towards connecting with, you only have so much time, and why is that time maybe not being used in a way you actually would like? Sometimes there's no choice, right? It's just about having to make a living. And you just have to stomach that thing. But you do make this point, and you do it in the Antidote book as well, about the path through the negative, like steering into discomfort. And so, yeah, I'm just wondering, what are the benefits of going, oh, shit, I'm going to die? Yeah, I think it, yeah, it's such a, it's an interesting question, partly because I think there is a reading of all this stuff, and maybe it's a judgment some people have made from, I don't know, the title of my book or something sometimes, that like what they're going to find is a kind of really intense argument that they should be doing remarkably extraordinary things with every day of their lives because there's only 4,000 weeks and that sort of seize the day idea which masquerades as being something subversive but I don't actually think is subversive at all and really what I hope the experience of the book but also yeah, the experience of letting finitude seep into your bones a little bit is that it's relaxing, empowering, but relaxing as well, right? Because it's this kind of reality that it's facing this reality that that it was always impossible to do the number of things that we feel pressured to do, that it was always impossible to partake of most or all of the experiences that the world has to offer. And that, 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 satisfying that kind of dissatisfaction, that scratching that itch is not 
on the cards for finite humans. And of course, that's where specifically consumerism, I don't know if you want to talk about that, but is obviously depends on not only keeping that itch unscratched, but on holding out the possibility that it will be soon. I know a lot of hospice nurses and having grown up in a temple, Buddhist temple, on my end, I do see a lot of Buddhism in some of the things that you say in, in 4,000 weeks. But Western culture especially has a very hard time with death. And a lot of Western culture is about distracting yourself from death rather than like prioritizing, right? That's one of the things that you mentioned because a lot of times, again, like a lot of what gets put as like proper prioritization in Western culture is still distraction. Yeah. One of the Buddhist thing is that life isn't, if you are constantly chasing pleasure, you will never be satisfied. And to a certain, if you want to take that to a neurochemical level with dopamine, that's also true. And so a lot of times the Buddhist focus has been a sense of grounded peace. Yeah. Right? That is really important in having a good life whatever various definitions of good life, like a grounded peace is important aspect of that. And to a certain degree, like working in my field, it's one of the things about addiction and pain and suffering and also like substance use. All these things like can seriously warp the individual perception of time. You know, when you're suffering, when you're in pain, when you are lost, mm -hmm. Time is extraordinarily slow, oftentimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And when things are good, you are content, time actually speeds up. Yes, yep, yep. There was a interview a long, long time ago that I was watching in Japan, and they were basically like interviewing terminally ill patients that have accepted that they were going to die and that were very content. And that was one of the perceptions of one of the gentlemen was like, he was like, yeah, like I was a very high power executive kind of situation. And he realized I never felt peace until I accepted death. And I was so distracted that I never bothered to find like the sense of groundedness, right? That groundedness does come from the sense that like everything in life is finite because a part of that immortality mentality and capitalism is also tied to the eternal growth of, of economics. Um, th this is fascinating. I'm really fascinated to hear you pick up on the Buddhist strand of things, specifically like I've found specifically in Zen, I don't know what the Buddhist tradition that you were raised in. Not Zen. Zen monks have to be celibate. <laughs> so that doesn't tend to be where you're raised as a kid. But the but it's, that's just one of the traditions that I've found this sort of expressed the most clearly. But this notion that fundamental to our suffering as finite humans is precisely this notion that there ought to be some way out of it and that there might be be some way out of it and that if we could only use our intellects well enough uh, we might be able to figure out some way out of it and there's that quote that I use as an epigraph to the book because it makes it's so important in my life it comes from uh, Jocko Beck the American Zen teacher who said what makes it unbearable she's talking about life in general I think what makes it unbearable is your mistaken belief that it can be cured and it's, if I can communicate why I think that's a deeply relaxing thought, then I've done my job because that trying to explain why I think that is ultimately a relaxing thought. I think of when Catholicism ruled Europe and the idea of the serfs was, this may be horrible, God's waiting for you. And so death might look pretty good compared to the way we're living now versus the Calvinist Protestant idea, which is that you accumulate and work and accumulate more and God rewards your industry, rather than this is a natural cycle and great stuff is waiting for you if you're obedient to the system. And it's so different. And I think America is most afflicted and most capitalist because of buying that stuff. 
that Calvinism that God rewards you because you're rich. And so you're good. And God will love you. Yeah, it's really interesting, actually, this... I, I think we should address some things that like, because ultimately this isn't nihilism. This is about actually when you readjust, realign with a kind of hard reality of your own short time on the planet, then certain things become priorities and certain things don't. But I do think that there, maybe this is a side, maybe I can cut it out, whatever. But I think there's this thing that you see sometimes perhaps online with some of the stoicism stuff, because part of the thing that is great about this 4,000 Weeks book is that you are pointing out some things that are worth paying attention to. And one of them is like essentially becoming comfortable with chaos, right? Uncertainty. Right. And developing a sort of an appropriate relationship with it. But one of the things you definitely see happen online is that there's this kind of the stoic thing, there's this grind culture, there's this tech bro thing of move fast and break stuff, the disruptor. And it's like they all operate on this kind of mindset of hey, you need to be comfortable with chaos to some degree. You need to like be the person that thrives in this sort of jungle of possibilities, as it were. So it's interesting. Again, everything could be co-opted. I guess I'm not making a profound point, but it's interesting that how even something... I might view as wise or wholesome, you can still twist it. There's still a way. There's still a way you can take it and make it, instrumentalize it for something else. Oh, um, yeah. And I think we just do that kind of completely instinctively. Any kind of new insight about how to live, just the old dispensation of our psychologies is just waiting to, to turn it into more of that. I've occasionally had emails from readers of the but basically expressing frustration that they're unable to perfectly implement the philosophy of the book or something. And I'm, and I always just have to be like, you realize I don't, right? You realize this is some thoughts about some alternative ways of being in time as opposed to a master plan for how to live a life <laughs> as stress-free and wonderful as mine, which, which is not the case, right? And so I think that's really the case. And certainly in that in that rediscovery of Stoicism, and particularly in the kind of the corners of it that get called rather amusingly Stoicism, there is this idea, it, it turn, something that is a, a philosophy or an outlook on life that on some level is to do with accepting how vulnerable we are to negative emotions, to death, to how much we depend on other people, does get turned into this, this attitude that, that's been called emotional bulletproofing, right? This idea that actually, not that you should be able to fully be here as a human with all the downsides and sadnesses and stresses that, that entails, but that you should be able to make yourself totally imperturbable. And I think actually some of the original Stoics Actually, there's a basis for that in the original Stoicism because at least some of those guys were literal slaves and uh, and are to be and admired for coming up with any form of psychological <laughs> coping mechanisms for that. But it, but there's a but there's a denial of reality in the idea that we're going to become fully emotionally imp imperturbable rather than a rather than an acknowledgement of our situation. Right. It's interesting. A variation of that is something that I'm familiar with because my husband's parents were part of the Holocaust and his mother became a time accomplishment fanatic because if you don't get everything right, you won't escape. If you stop and admire the flowers on the way, you'll get caught. So that everything must be utilitarian. Also, she was German, which is part of that as well. This idea that any time of relaxation is literally a waste of time. And honeymoon, and in Italian, luno miel, mielo, and lune miel in French, in German, it's a flittewache. It's a week to fritter away your time. It's a different attitude. And that is a very Anglo Saxon attitude. This probably doesn't necessarily go anywhere to say this, but yeah, I'm, this is extremely close to my heart because as I mentioned in the book, my my paternal grandmother fled Nazi Germany in age sort of 12 or 13. And I think that a certain kind of anxiety 
towards the control of time pretty much passed down through the generations quite easily yeah. because people are sometimes put in situations where attempting to, I've got a whole sort of riff in the book teasing my father about leaving four hours to get to the railway station when we're going on holiday or something when I was a kid. But you can see where this concern with trying to get everything right and maintain some kind of grip on on how life is unfolding is going to be deeply impressed in people's psyches. That kind of thing. Yeah. yeah, that's fascinating actually, isn't it? Because it's like the trauma of those experiences sucks away the joy of wasting time, if you like. Because I think the thing that I really resonated with the book or I feel an affinity with is that the time that you have as much as you can, you should just go enjoy it. <laughs> like find some fun, find some love, just if you can. Yeah. And, and I think that... Does I really have gone. Sorry, sorry. No, just quickly to close up that thought, maybe, I don't know, but the, the instrumentalizing force of capitalism and, this, and, and of the American dream and of all the kind of ideas that, that, that suggest that the wonderful future is ahead, the real meaning of life is ahead, if only you can mm-hmm. make the most efficient use of time and get through all the stuff allies with the kind of that those sort of intergenerational trauma type things where it's always your well-being is dependent on keeping up a certain standard i go on about this too much these days and i think it probably is going to sound stupid but i had this extraordinary experience watching with my six-year-old son the disney movie in canto about a year ago which i was expecting to be in Another kind of watching a Disney movie with a Saturday afternoon or whatever, but which looks at, among other things, that it's a it's in the Colombian heritage, uh, the sort of intergenerational trauma thing there. But like this idea of like how many people feel that their sort of right to exist is dependent on a certain level of standard meeting and of productivity and of efficiency. So you not only get the sort of dream of the wonderful paradise that's coming if you just get efficient enough but you're also running away from the thought that like if you stopped instrumentalizing your time and just were you that this would be challenging from a sort of self-worth point of view yeah a huge part of homelessness and why poverty and why it never gets eradicated is because it's it's function in a capitalist society is as a disciplinary force yes and and the reality of it is that if you become sick, if you're mentally ill, if you're medically disabled or physically disabled, and you don't necessarily come with a trust fund or people that are willing to take care of you, you do die. Like you, you are literally thrown to the streets to die. Right. And this is something that, you know whether many individuals do not accept this as a society, this is considered proper function of society and that these people just were layabouts that deserve to die. And it acts as a grim motivational force. Yes, because you even occasionally hear parents with children when you're walking down the street, oh, if you don't work hard, you're going to be like that man. Right. I even remember hearing, not exactly in those words, but similar things from different parents growing up. A huge part of like free time and like this time to do nothing is a very class based, like you have to deserve it. If you are poor, you do not deserve any free time or joy. Or joy, or it's one of those things where like rent's expensive and if you have to work three jobs to maintain it, that's your problem. That's your fault. That's your fault for not going to school. That's your fault for not attending to your duties in school and diligently working yourself up that class ladder. You could make the case as well, that sort of disdain for the homeless is also feeding into that denial of finitude and death right like it's better to just put all your uh, fears in that place like a displacement thing right and it's not the only it's not the only example i think it's in the comes from the very long indian spiritual epic whose name i'm forgetting right now but anyway this kind of famous observation that we think the same a little bit about people who are ill and infirm and dying but how terrible to be them 
Maybe in the case of homelessness, there's more contempt than sympathy. But either way, that's a distancing reaction, right? It's That's not me when, of course, it's you in all, it's us in all sort of fundamental human respects. One of the more terrifying developments is just recently it was coursing through a discourse among landlords and how many people were just saying, oh, the homeless just should be put out of their misery and euthanized. It's also just, it's really interesting if you're, I don't know if you're, I'm I'm assuming people are familiar. So there was a famous actor called Michael J. Fox, and he developed Parkinson's pretty early in life and has spent his life advocating for treatment and research of Parkinson's for a cure or at least better management. And it's it's gotten to the point now he's a little bit older than me where in interviews, like his Parkinson's is like a lot more advanced. He speaks about like, I don't know how much time I have left, but he also has talked about how he's lived a fairly blessed life. He's had successful marriage. He's had loves his kids. He's spent his life in his opinion working for a important cause that impacts millions of people. And it's just incredible when you look at some of the comment feeds of again, like how how much people ignore that, that subjective experience of his life and be like, again, same thing of he should he should request medically assisted dying. Because no one's allowed ASAP. to be no one's allowed to be <laughs> vulnerable. Because ultimately one aspect of the huge fear of dying is not necessarily just that like you're just gonna drop dead and die. A huge aspect of the fear in dying is oftentimes it, it is accompanied by potentially prolonged illness and suffering. Yeah, and if you're not able to be productive, you are worthless. And that's where you should just go have euthanasia, that, all that stuff. Part of the whole, whole concept of the way we use time as time is money, time is efficient, Time is using time successfully to get more money. The goad in a capitalist society is get more. It's a different goad if you think the the motive or the goad is I can participate in the community. I can feel love. I can give love. I can receive love. I can be part of this community. And I know I noticed it. I visited Mondragon, which is a city in Spain which consists of 104 co-ops, and they operate as a city, and no one is allowed to be paid more than the highest paid worker, and people are elected to office, supervisor of some kind or another all the way to the top, and can be unelected after a very few years. And the whole feeling was different being in that city and i think it was because the idea is everybody fits and if people are handicapped they can still pack things they know that there isn't some people are useless everybody was useful and that idea that we all participate and are important to the whole is i think the antidote to the curse of the four thousand weeks which is a capitalist curse and it needs a reevaluation of what important means, right? It needs a re. It means a. This speaks to something I've thought about and a lot and written about a bit. That, like you know, what counts as meaningful activity in life is very distorted in any kind of culture dedicated to fame or even technological innovation. You know, the idea that the ordinary can't be meaningful is really is part of that whole. Right. Uh, yes, it is, yeah. and part of it is efficient for what? For human connection for human happiness or producing more or making more money. So the concept of efficiency is fine if you think it's efficient for creating a humane and loving community, but people connote efficient with producing more, which is the perversion of the language to the culture. Yeah. But you do, in the book, you do talk about the sort of instruments instrumentalization of leisure time and (laughs) i like the sort of hobby as a subversive force right like harriet you were talking about like efficiency is fine it just depends what it's for 
And like the point you make with the hobby is I'm not doing this for money. I'm not do- I'm spending my money. I'm not doing this to be the world's ba- best or anything. It's just, I'm just doing it just for the act of doing it. There's a joy in that. I, I just think it's really interesting that hobbies are slightly embarrassing, right? To admit to having a hobby these days, but side hustles are really cool. And yeah. the only difference is that one of them is 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 focused on on it's instrumentalized but also specifically instrumentalized on becoming profitable and uh, yeah i mean i find that i have to make myself i don't know if this is true for you guys i have to make myself go on hikes or sit down and play the piano which is specifically i think is important for me because i'm not good at it and i'm never going to get good at it and it's very freeing about that I'm not even trying to reach mastery in a hobby there I'm just doing it because it's fun it doesn't come naturally it doesn't come easily it's I'd far rather check off some more items on the to-do list at least in some sense to and, some uh, yeah. extent this is genderized too because if you're taking care of children which has been part of women's assignment they don't operate productively efficiency in that in the capitalist sense they have to wash their hands before they go out then they have to watch the bubbles they have to make little splashes they have to do all sorts of things that make you much later if you want to get out at a particular time and people who are in the rhythm of caring for children have to adjust that kind of idea i certainly found that as a mother who was primarily responsible for two little kids, that their idea of walking somewhere at, if they're in toilet training is stopping and admiring every dog shit. Okay. <laughs> so it's four times more to get down the block. Yeah, yeah. No, and I don't want to completely smother the gender point that you made there by saying, I know exactly what it's like as a father. I don't know exactly what it's like to be a mother, but I do have some, that that sense in which you are just pulled into the rhythms of the world by kids and especially very young kids, no matter what conceptual systems you may be seeking to (laughs) placate with your day. It doesn't matter. It's, that's not how it's going to, how it's going to work. And how it's going to run. Yeah. I also like that as life advice, like you now and again, you just need to stop and admire the dog shit. (laughs) <laughs> that's cool but like yeah, the fridge fridge magnet <laughs> it's here on a t-shirt but yeah it, it's really interesting whether it's the hobby or whether it's just not necessarily work related but things that are important to you you make the point that the discomfort of what matters right like the in some ways the distraction thing is easy whereas actually things that matter to you are actually difficult to get started and to get going on and that's paradoxical right you would think that the things that are meaningful to you would have an easy beginning to them and you think about this point about steering into problems or developing a taste for having problems now of course i think there's good problems and bad problems i think equis outline serious bad problems with society and i think a functioning society means in theory you only have good problems left right it's not about your house or your inability to afford food or all that kind of stuff. I don't know if you want to talk, A, maybe a bit more about this idea of steering into discomfort and also like the relief, the joy of missing out as well, because (laughs) by doing one thing, you can't do another, right? Sure. Yeah. I think they're connected because the first point is just this notion that it's not a coincidence that the things that we care about the most are the things that we're most willing to try to distract ourselves from. It's not a coincidence that this came up in the context of social media because over the last decade, we've become so alert to the ways in which our attention is being commandeered by social media platforms. But I wanted to say that's true, but we go along with it, right? I'm not sitting there working on a book chapter when suddenly Twitter comes and grabs me against my will. I'm really keen to go off there because of the way it's been structured and because partly because of the way it's been structured, but also because doing something that I care about in my creative work is hard and it brings up like problematic feelings. Like I don't know if I can do it or I don't know if I can meet the deadline. It's, it's awkward. Same with kind of conversations with people closest to us. It's like, they can be uncomfortable. They can go wrong. They can leave us feeling vulnerable. So yeah, of course it's more fun to not have them and to 
distract ourselves instead. And then the joy of missing out thing is just this notion that if you're going to miss out anyway, it's uncomfortable to acknowledge that, right? It's uncomfortable to not keep chasing this note. There's actually something comfortable about the fear of missing out because it reinforces the notion that it might conceivably be possible one day to not be missing out. And actually, I think there's really great liberation in in understanding that we're, we will get to partake in such a tiny proportion of the experiences that the world has to offer. And that's yeah. just a given. At, yeah. that point, you can, at that point, you can just plunge into it. I did just want to say one thing about that you were pointing out about different kinds of problems, right? Absolutely. I think the, the goal for a in a just society would be that everyone would still have problems, but there would be like at the good end of the scale of problems. It's the habit of turning the sheer existence of problems into a problem that I think is the issue here. And this has come up a bit in responses to the book, even a little bit when I was writing it and in terms of conversations with editors. We're living in a period of political debate when people are extremely alert to saying this is different for different groups of people. And I've always wanted to say, yeah, totally, but that's another book. <laughs> and the one that I'm trying to sit right here, are, there are certain fundamental ways in which like, this is a unifying experience that we all have. And this kind of attempt to get away from having any problems at all is one part of it. Mm. Yeah, I think yeah. That, that was in an introductory to Buddhism book I read many years ago was like, you will always have 37 problems, but Buddhism can help you with your 38th, which is thinking you can get rid of problems. But I, the other thing about missing out, or the joy of missing out, the fear of missing out, the, the funny thing is that it always can feel like the party is somewhere else. And I thought your story about turning up to see the Northern Lights and just being like, nah. <laughs> it's like there's even even these sort of things, which can be like these tentpole moments that are particularly in... Instagram or tourist related things. Oh, I've got to go experience that because everyone else is doing it. They can just be completely flat experiences. And then you think that's weird. Yeah. And specifically in that example, I think also what I'm trying to get at is like an attempt to really be present in the moment and really suck the marrow out of life very easily backfires and becomes its own like effortful to like extract maximal value out of life. And we all know that like the times that it in hindsight, turn out to have been some of the most meaningful and valuable. We weren't expecting it or really trying. Yeah, I think one aspect of a lot of the fear of missing out is also just if you expect so much out of an experience, it's always going to fall short. We are very much a hype culture. We're not a culture that like has this moderated, hey guys, here are the pros, here are the cons. <laughs> it's always just, it's a best thing ever this is going to change your life or it's it's the worst thing ever and it's going to ruin your life don't you think that reality has a way of just always enforcing itself in some manner because the i was lucky enough i got some cheap deal thing to go to iceland for three nights and luckily saw the northern lights but the experience was fascinating because it was a, really fleeting. It wasn't like a big dramatic hours of Northern Light stuff. We were on this sort of bus tour and all these people that got off the bus because they're like, hey, th it's about to happen or something's happening there. They're all like a whole bunch of people, this group that was standing next to us were scrambling for their cameras, <laughs> trying to get it and trying to get it. <laughs> yeah. And then they yeah. just couldn't capture it in their little box and the moment had passed and then it didn't turn up again. And I just had this thing of it. It was a moment. I really enjoyed seeing it. But at the same time, I got this sort of biosmosis. I just felt really bad for them because they missed it they missed it yes. trying to yes. capture it yeah you know. have to be willing to let experiences go in some sense in order to really have them yeah yeah but you have to be present right there's yeah. a very wonderful book by langston hughes with photographs by roy de caraba and it's about a janitor and his life and saint peter comes to tell him you gotta die the guy's old and roomy eyed and he says i can't go now I'm all caught up in the sweet flypaper of life. And the whole book is about him marveling at the sweet flypaper of life, watching his little niece grow up and seeing things on the corner. It's the opposite of the capitalist productivity imperative. It's a beautiful little book. Yeah, there, there is a quote in your book where you were quoting someone else, which definitely blew my mind. Nature doesn't disdain what lives for a day. 
it pours mm. the whole of itself into each moment. Life's bounty is yeah. in its flow. Later is too late. It's uh, from uh, the coast of Utopia, Tom Stoppard. It's amazing. But yeah, we've come towards the end of the hour there. I don't know if there's anything maybe we haven't maybe touched on or addressed that anyone wants to talk about. I think this has been really important because the psychological flagellation, self-beating that people do Mm -hmm. around the concept of time as a judge of whether you're worthy is a huge psychological problem that afflicts our culture. So I think it's a really important book that you have written, Oliver. Thank you. Thank you. I've really enjoyed this conversation, which is, as you can imagine, not exactly the same as some other conversations I've had around the book. You do have these various different things in uh, towards the end of the book of five things to think about or these ten things and I think they're really useful but I think in general the principle of just like that idea of by definition you're just going to miss out on things you don't have to be a rock star it's like the fight club thing about learning you're not all going to be rock stars and movie stars and now they're all pissed off but it's yeah. yours is saying that but from a different angle it's yeah you're free from that just have an ordinary life and appreciate what you can. I think that there is a, yeah, it feels giving yourself some slack to just be a human being. Very important. Thank you for making this happen. It's an extraordinary multi-time zone undertaking. <laughs> yes. So, uh, yes. Yeah. But yeah, thanks very much for your time. And thanks for writing the book. I've sent it to a load of friends and they've all just, yeah, really got a lot from it. So thank you for I'm, writing. I'm, I'm enough of a capitalist to endorse yeah, to any that. increase yeah. in sales. Thank you. <laughs> Massive thank you as always to our VIP patrons, Rebecca Johns, Bruce Rogers Vaughan, Alexander Lashley, Sheena Belmas, Seamus O'Connell, Alex Placito, Alexandra McCormick, Wig Shaker, Elizabeth McKechnie, J. Daniel Richer, Fontaine, and Sean Venado. By the way, listeners, if you have enjoyed anything you've heard Harriet say in this program, you will definitely enjoy Capitalism Hits Home, which is a solo program that Harriet does through Democracy at Work, which is a worker-owned cooperative that produces other great programs such as Economic Update with Richard Wolff and the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles with David Harvey. I can't recommend enough that everyone also listen to Capitalism Hits Home if you enjoy It's Not Just in Your Head. And if you want to hear even more from Harriet, check out her radio show, Interpersonal personal update on WBAI and in the WBAI archives.